imani nayo kuhakika kwa mambo yanayotarajiwa baya baya yale mambo yasiyokonekana imani tuwe nayo maisha ni mwetu
ni mwana yeye ni mwaminifu Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We thank God for this Sabbath afternoon that God has granted to you and to me. We basically want to continue with our series of studies. We thank God for the lesson study that there was in the morning. We thank God for the children's story. We thank God for the beautiful singing. And also for the sermon that we shared in in the morning. And I recall we spoke about the Lord's strange deliverances. How God has come through for us in situations and in ways that we did not envisage. In things that we thought were too simplistic. And so God does not respect any man. He does not respect situations and he can work through anything just to advance his cause. In our small Bible study this afternoon, we want to consider the life of John the Baptist. And uh, the title of my study this afternoon is The Strange Location. The Strange Location. Let's pray. We thank you once again, Almighty Father, for your faithfulness. It is the reason we are still alive and, Lord, we have not been consumed by the cares of this life. I want to thank you for your sons and daughters that, Lord, are listening to your voice at a point in time in an environment that is not common, in situations that, Lord, we find strange, in places that, Lord, in themselves are strange, because ordinarily, we would have converged in the church, in the buildings that are called by your name. But circumstances, Lord, have deemed it fit that we can once again correspond and congregate at various places. We thank you for this session. We pray that you open our spiritual eyes and ears, that we may listen to your voice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, as I said before, we want to consider the text. We want to consider the life of this man, John the Baptist. We want to bring his life into perspective. Now, the Bible tells us that there is a man that is called Zechariah. Zechariah is the father of John the Baptist, and he has a wife whose name is Elizabeth. Zechariah was a priest in the temple, and he had no child for such a long space of time. The long period of waiting was so long, it brings a lot of stress sometimes, and not sometimes. But should you find yourself in a situation, in a relationship that children are not forthcoming, we really appreciate that children are a heritage. The Bible says they come from God. It is a situation that is not friendly. It is always stressful. The biblical account is there for Hannah and how she suffered at it. We see how Manoah's family, we see even now in the story of this young man, an angel of the Lord God appears to Zechariah while he's at the temple and he is offering sacrifices and tells him that he's going to have a son and the son shall be called John. The son is going to be special. He shall have the spirit of God in fill him from the day he is born. And uh, it talks about how he shall be raised and where he shall grow. So that is the picture that the Bible gives us about the birth of John the Baptist. And so the Bible tells us that he grows up and he is a man that is raised in the wilderness. John does not grow in the company of men. John grows in the company of the wild animals, a place that he has enough time to, to reflect, a place that he has enough time to meditate, a place that John does not have the company. He is not to be affected. He is not to be infected by the circumstances as we know it. So the Bible tells us where John began his ministry, and the Bible tells us that his ministry was actually done by the River Jordan. That is where he used to be. And so the Bible tells us in verses 3 of, of Luke chapter 3, 
that he went into all country. I mean, the Bible tells us about Herod because John used to preach by, he used to preach by River Jordan. So in the 15th year, the Bible says in verses 1 uh, of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was the governor of Judea, Herod the Tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip the Tetrarch of Iturea and Traconias and Lystras, uh, the Tetrarch of Abilene. During his priesthood of Anas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to Zechariah. That is what we have mentioned uh, in regards to John, yeah? Zechariah in the desert. So he went into all places written, preaching. So when people came to ask of John who he was, this is what he would tell them. A voice that is calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight the paths for him, every valley shall be filled, every mountain and every hill shall be made low, and the crooked roads shall be made straight. And the rough way is smooth, and the mankind will see the goodness of the Lord. So people came to John asking him what they were supposed to do in the beginning of his ministry. And so he told them, uh, what shall we do then? The Bible says, the crowd asked, John answered, the man that has two tunics, let him share his tunics with one that has none. And one who has, had, who has food should, should do the same. Tax collectors came and asked him, teacher, what should we do? Do not collect any more than you are required to do, he told them. And then the soldiers came and asked him, what should we do? He replied, do not, ex do not extort money and don't accuse people falsely and be contented with your pay. Eventually, uh, people came to him to baptize them and John tells them in verse 16 of Luke 3, I baptize you with water, but one that is more powerful, John says, than I am will come, the thongs whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with the power. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather, to gather the wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with the unquenchable fire. So now, people would listen to him. And everyone desiring to know because the gospel of John was simple. John preached, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. So people wanted to be ready for this kingdom that was actually at hand. And so John desired that these people must be prepared for that kingdom that is due to come. So many people went to John for baptism. And as the Bible records in the book of Matthew chapter 3, that among the people that aligned themselves for baptism of John included Christ Jesus. And so John says in Matthew 3 verse 11 that I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me will come one that is more powerful than I am, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork again is a repetition of what we read in Luke. And so verse 13 then Jesus came from Galilee to the, to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But then John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Of course, Jesus told him in verse 15, Let it be so, it is proper for us to do so to fulfill all righteousness. Now John feels the need that it is Christ that is supposed to baptize him because he feels inadequate. He feels he does not deserve to baptize Christ. But Christ reasons, you must baptize me so that all the scriptures can be fulfilled and that we can fulfill all righteousness. And now there is an event that is keen for us to notice even in our study here. The Bible says in verse, 30, verse 16, as soon as Jesus was baptized and he went up out of the water, at that moment the heaven was opened and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lightning and lighting on him. And our voice came from heaven and said, This is my Son whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. I want us to observe that the Trinity is getting involved here. In the creation of man, there is a discussion in Genesis 1.26, let us make man in our own image and likeness, and how man is supposed to have dominion over the folds of the air, uh, the birds and the animals of the land, and even the fish of the sea. 
and that we are supposed to rule and to govern them. The Bible records that. And now at the baptism of Jesus, we also notice the heavens are opening and God is speaking up from heaven. Christ is on the water and the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove comes and of course, patches on his shoulder, and the confirmatory voice is, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Now you need to notice that John did not care who is in the audience. John was a preacher that did not mince his words. John was straight speaking. John did not mind being politically correct. He called things as he saw them. He called things as they were. Now you will need to realize here, that whereas John was in the wilderness, he also knew what was transpiring in the city. So on one occasion, the Bible says that Herod find himself coming uh, by Jordan to listen to John speak. And one of my favorite speeches, preachers comes and uh, on narrating this, he says, Herod asks, uh, at what time does it begin? And the man that was by him says, well, John begins at any time. How long does it take? Well, you never know. It can be short, it can be long. So where do people sit here? You see, as you can see, your, your Highness, there are no reserved seats for men like you here. So I think this stone can make do. So while he sits in the audience, and John, as he was preaching, sees Herod, and he tells him straight to his face, it is not correct thing to do that you should be with Herodias, who is your brother's wife, and all the evil things that he had done. And because John had said this to Herod, it was not something good. Of course, Herod went home and shared with Herodias the situation as it were, that the man of God does not approve of their union because their union amounts to adultery, their union amounts to both bigamy and polygamy at the same time, in the sense that Herod has taken Herodias, who is the wife of Philip, actually his uncle, so, he has sent away his wife, who is actually, the daughter of the king, is actually the daughter of the king of Arabia. And so, Herodias has Philip, who is a living husband, alive. And then, now she has who? Herod. Is this what you want to call polyandry? Well, John does not, does not mean words. So he tells the king to his face that this that you are doing is wrong. And consequently, the king gets annoyed, but because he's afraid, he is not going to do anything to John the Baptist because the men consider John the Baptist as a prophet of God. But now the Bible tells us that the wife, upon hearing what was transpiring, upon hearing how they are being uh, embarrassed in quotes, she hatches a scheme. And therefore she nags the king for such a long time and tells the king, you know, how do you keep quiet when that man is loose in the wilderness? That man is free. He continues to disrepute our name. He continues to speak these unspeakable things about us. Isn't it about time that you get hold of this man and you put him behind the prison? You know, when you put him in prison, yes, he may still talk, but no one hears. And so we will be safe from this defamation. We are going to be okay, and no one will be talking ill of us. And now, think with me, my brothers and sisters. John is a man that is used to a life that is free. John is a man that is used to, you know, picking honey from the honeycombs and eating. He would eat locusts in the wilderness. He would sleep in any place that he feels convenient, depending on the situation and the status of the weather. A man that is not used to confinement. If you wish, John is wild in quotes. Of course, he puts on the skin. He has never been used to confinement from the time he was born and prepared for the ministry. And now, because of Herodias and her schemes, she decides that John needs to be put in confinement that John needs to be tamed. But now, something happens here, and this is what, for me, is of interest and probably uh, worth considering in our study for, for this day. So now, Jesus has been put, John has been put in prison, and the ministry of Jesus is going on. When the ministry of Jesus is going on, a lot of things are happening. A lot of things are happening, 
And John finds himself in a territory that is not friendly. He finds himself subjected to meals he is not used to. He finds himself when freedom is now gone. You know, the situation of John can be similar to the situation that men have now found themselves in. Men that are used to leaving so early in the morning and coming very late in the evening. Men that are always so busy doing everything here and there. The situation of COVID-19 has brought men home. And I have listened to a few discussions of how people talk, that the ladies are so, so energized, and the ladies are finding things so beautiful. For once, they have handed over all the assignments that are being sent from the WhatsApp groups by teachers, and the fathers have by default become teachers. And so whereas the ladies are liking it, men are feeling so imprisoned. And I listened to one that is saying that life is so hectic. In fact, they're really wishing when corona is going to come to an end that they can resume life as they know of it. But on the contrary, some number of men are not finding things interesting. And one is complaining about children, and there is a lot of tension that is happening, and the situation looks nearly exactly the same as what John is going through in the prison cells. Life is not comfortable. The situation is extremely different. He begins to recall the scriptures. He begins to think of the things he has known. And he comes to a point in time that he's almost getting disillusioned. Nothing seems to happen. Things are getting out of hand. And John is becoming so stressed to a point that now John looks for his disciples. He sends word. The disciples come to visit John, the Bible says. The Bible says in the book of Luke chapter 7 that the disciples went to visit John to go and see him in his prison cells. Notice the Bible says it's a good thing to visit people, those that are sick and to visit those that are in prison. So the disciples go to visit John and they find him in prison cells and I speak with him. They tell him of how the ministry of Jesus is progressing. And I recall the words of John in John chapter 3 and verses 31 that he must increase as I decrease. Now Job, John has not only increased, to, I mean has not only decreased to an extent that is not active in ministry, but he has so decreased that he is actually in the prison cell. And while at it, with his mind and the things that are boggling up his mind, a stressed man as he was, the Bible says now in Luke chapter 7 and verses 18. So John's disciples told him of the things that was of all these things. Calling two of them, he sent them to the Lord and asked, tell, told them, ask him, are you the one who was to come or should we expect someone else? Now this is the question that bothers my mind. This is the question that bothers my mind, especially in the context of John chapter 1 and verses 29. Now listen to these words, brothers. This is what John himself says in John 1, 29. The next day John saw Jesus coming towards him and he said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, A man who comes after me has surpassed me because he has been before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. Verse 32. Then John gave the te this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. I would not have known him except that the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the one on whom the Spirit come down and remain on him, will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testify that this is the Son of God. Now this then is the question. John was told beforehand that the one that you shall see, the Spirit of God descend upon, shall be the one that is the Messiah, shall be the one that is to set the children of Israel free. He shall be the one that you had been told about, the one whose shoe lashes you are not worthy to untie. And now John, that had seen Jesus and said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Now, because of the present situation, things are so thick that he begins to doubt if indeed Jesus, as he had told the people, is indeed the Messiah. Have you found yourself in a situation, brother and sister, that you begin to ask 
if indeed what you thought as true is still true? Are there circumstances that you've doubted the very teachings that you've known? Probably from the very someones you yourselves have made. Have circumstances come to you that you have begun to cast doubt and to cast aspersion over the claims that you have held so dear in the times past? Have situations been so thick in your life that what was initially so clear eventually becomes so blurred and ultimately dark? So John finds himself here. Now you need to recall that Mary and Elizabeth are actually cousins. And that is why in Luke chapter 2, when Mary comes to visit Elizabeth, Elizabeth is so happy and she says that at the hearing of your voice, the boy inside me jumped for joy. And that is to say that as Mary was talking to Elizabeth, John responded to the voice. He was so excited, he was so happy to the voice of the one that is to become the Messiah. So John, that before birth recognizes Jesus and becomes happy because Mary is already expecting and therefore salutation from John to salutation of Mary to Elizabeth, the little boy listens to the voice of the mother of his cousin who is to become the Redeemer. And how situations are so thick that John begins to doubt, is Jesus really the one that I spoke about? Well, I am not sure what you're thinking. Chances are, the things you had hoped for are slowly becoming elusive. But I just want to comfort with you. The cells made John begin to reflect and to doubt if indeed things are true. You know what? In the human mind, Jesus being John's cousin, John had expected him to pay him a visit. John, knowing that Jesus is to be the Messiah, must do something to liberate him, to get him out of the very prison that he was put, courtesy of the Roman kingdom. And so a lot of expectations that John had on Jesus that do not appear to be transpiring because of his present situation. Remember our topic of study, the strange situation, the strange location. So John finds himself alienated from the world as he knows it. He cannot find time to do what he can. Figuratively speaking, he is not going to move, but his mind is wandering aloud. So when John asks that the disciples go and ask Jesus if he is the one that is supposed to come, or they should continue to wait, it is because the waiting has taken toll of him, and things are thick. Now the Bible says in verses 20, that when the men, that is in the book of Luke chapter 7 and verses 20, when the men came to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to ask you, are you the one who was to come or should we expect someone else? At that very time, Jesus cured. Now Jesus did not answer, did not give them a question. But you'll recall in the book of Luke chapter 3, when people came to ask John if he was the prophet, when they asked John if he is the Messiah, when they asked John if he is indeed, you know, uh, Elijah, he told them, hey, tell us who you are so that we may find an answer to go and give to the people who sent us. That was the question that they had asked him. But now, Jesus, when this question is asked, that was the book of Luke chapter, chapter sorry, John chapter 1 is where they are asking, now give us an answer so that we may give a response in verse 23 to those that have sent us. And so in this particular account, Jesus does not grant an answer to the disciples, but he goes about doing his businesses as usual. And so the Bible says this is what happens, that he cured many that had, been, had diseases, sicknesses and evil spirits, and gave sight to many who were blind. So he replied to the messengers, when he has gone about doing everything, go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. So tell him, the blind receive their sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, and the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. Blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of me. Now take regard to the last verse, verse 23 that we just read. Blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of me. Listen. Go and tell John that even though his situation looks desperate, there is something bigger than his own personal situation that we are addressing here. 
In fact, later on when the disciples have gone, Jesus tells them that of all the men that are born of women, there is none that is greater than John the Baptist. And I tell you for sure, there is none that is greater than John the Baptist. For the prophets of old longed to see my days that John himself has seen, heralding that I am the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And actually he tells them that if you want to believe, John is indeed the Elijah that was to come. Friends, so there are circumstances and situations in life that can make you begin to doubt what you initially thought was correct. There are circumstances in life, even as we are going through, you know, it is not easy at this point in time. For whatever reason, you may find yourself in, an, in, a, in a place of isolation. Could be because you did not beat or keep the curfew of time. You have found yourself in a place of isolation. For 14 days it is, you must stay there, after which you will be tested. If you do not post, if you do not test the positive results, we hope you will be released. But if you are taken there as a result of violation, unfortunately, there is some fee you've got to pay before you can be released. During this space of time, it can be unfamiliar, like it was to John the Baptist. You know what? If unfortunately you find yourself positive, again you're going to undergo isolation and we are trusting God that you're going to recover and once you recover, you shall be released. But while in situations like that, you may get to doubt and to ask lots of questions, does God still listen to me? You may be thinking how probably you contracted the disease. You try to reflect and nothing seems to come through. You find yourself in an unfamiliar situation. Lots of things are bothering your mind. It is unfortunate for some people that you find yourself in a quarantine. Eventually you may contract the disease and in isolation some people may pass on. And others actually have passed on. Even without the company of their beloved family. And sometimes the burial is again done the way it is. People feel like they didn't even have time for a decent send-off for one of their own. In situations like that, you ask yourself, if indeed, is your faith founded in the right place? And so I just want to encourage yourselves that the words of Jesus to John, blessed is the man who does not fall away on the account of me, Gave Job some ray of hope. The fact that John can hear, the blind are seeing. The fact that he can hear, that the deaf are hearing. The fact that the dead are being raised to life. Gave Job an assurance that indeed his testimony was not in vain. And while he was still imprisoned, he had the joys from above. And we actually know that angels were ministering to John, reaffirming to him that indeed his ministry is coming to an end, but he has heralded, he has championed for the kingdom of God that indeed is at hand. While your situation may not look familiar, environment has changed in your present situation. The curfew takes toll on you. You must leave extremely early to be the traffic jam to find yourself at home. Chances are situations are not what you thought. It is even more desperate. No wonder there is a lot of physical violence today because men are stressed, women are stressed, children are stressed, and nothing seems to work. But there is good news, friends. There is still God in heaven, and God is still in control. Comfort yourself. Be of good cheer. Why? Though the sorrows, the Bible says in Proverbs, in the book of Psalms, chapter 13, verse 35, that it will not last forever. And as John the Baptist, there is word that Jesus says, Blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of me. Even in your trying moments, as it were with John. Friend, are you trusting on Jesus? Even in this difficult situation. Are you trusting on him? You could be in a quarantine center. But you know what? God is still God. He does not change. He still has your best interest at heart. Are you going to surrender your life to him? Are you going to pay attention to that, says the Lord? He says, finally, in the last text that we want to, let me just paraphrase it. In the book of Isaiah, chapter number 43, that I know you, I have called you by your name. Even though you walk through the flooded rivers, they shall not over flood you. Even though you go through fire, you will not burn. Why? The word of God has spoken. And unlike John, friends, situation can be terrible. But where is your hope? Where is your faith? Is your faith grounded on the foundation that cannot be moved, grounded firm and deep in the Savior's love? Is that where your faith is? Where is your faith built, brothers? Is it built on the sinking sand? If it is built on the firm foundation of Christ Jesus, it will stand. And I pray 
that God can fortify your faith, that you can see beyond the walls of confinement, that you can see beyond the walls of seclusion, that you can see beyond COVID-19, because we are going to meet on the other side of Corona. Corona must come to pass. May God motivate you. May he assure you that until God says it is over, it is not over. But when God says it is over, it is truly over. Let's believe and pray. We thank you, Lord, for reminding us yet again that we may find ourselves in unfamiliar territory in this world. We thank you, Jesus, for you rightly said in John chapter 16 and verses 33, that indeed in this world there shall be trouble, but do not be troubled, for I have overcome the world. We thank you, Lord, that even though we find ourselves in situations that are difficult, circumstances behind or within and among ourselves might suggest that indeed nothing is forthcoming. There are times that people have waited, Lord, and after waiting for a long time, despair has come upon them. And the prince of darkness has begun to cast doubts and aspirations in them. In times like this, we ask you, O Lord, like the disciples, increase our faith. In situations that are so difficult, O Lord, we ask you, we cry to you like Peter, O Lord, save me. And so, Lord, I want to thank you for your sons and daughters that are listening to us. We want to thank you, Lord, for the children that are called by your name. We want to thank you, Lord, for the fathers and the mothers. We have found ourselves in confinement, in situations unfamiliar, Lord, that we must even do ministry online because it is not possible to congregate as we used to know. But even in these strange situations, you are still God. And we thank you, Lord, because your voice can be heard. We thank you for the increase in wisdom. We thank you, Lord, for technology that even makes this possible. And I want to pray, King of Glory, for those of us in quarantine centers, give them comfort. We pray for those in isolation, so dear Father, they need you. We pray for those that are already sick, Jehovah Father, extend your healing arms upon them for the glory and for the honor of your name. We pray, Lord, even for the families that have lost their beloved ones, so dear Father, they need to hear from you that indeed you are the Alpha and the Omega, you are the resurrection of the dead, and that death does not have the final word over us. We thank you, Christ, because you say you hold the keys of death and heads. And Lord, the voice of the archangel shall be heard, and the dead in Christ must resurrect. We want to pray, Lord, for our medics, our brothers and sisters that, Lord, have risked everything for the sake of the others. They have risked, oh dear Father, their own life, their own, you know, Lord, they have risked being infected. They know how disastrous this is with multiple organ failures, oh Lord, but they are there because of this call for humanity. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that, Lord, you will sanctify them, that, Lord, you will keep them, oh dear Father, you will sustain them, oh dear Father, and in the interest of their selflessness, oh dear Father, Keep them from harm and danger. We pray that, Lord, you will keep them safe. We pray that, Lord, this comes to an end for the glory and for the honor of your name. Father, there is nothing impossible with you. You brought back even those that were dead. Corona, Jehovah, Father, is nothing before you. We pray that a quick solution is found for your name's sake. Glory and honor, we return to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. May God bless you. May God keep you. Keep safe. Till then, bye.